evening, everybody. Really excited to have everybody out. This is the second night of uh, a three, three uh, in a row speaker series. We have another one coming up tomorrow. If you don't have your speaker series guide, we've got some in the back that'll give you the times and dates. Grab one. I'm Michael Shaw. I'm on the board of directors at Riverscape, and it's a real pleasure to welcome everybody out. I'm seeing some familiar faces. A lot of you have been hitting quite a few of these, and I think a few new people, so we're glad to have you here. Uh, Riverscape's a membership organization, and it's a support of a lot of you. Again, I see a lot of members that uh, help make this possible, along with some donors. So we want to thank you guys. And if you are interested in knowing more about Riverscape, grab me, uh, Susan Doley, uh, Larry Cassain, Charlie Williams. The three of you, raise your hands. If you aren't a Riverscape member, these guys are on the board of directors. And myself, grab one of them. They can tell you more about the organization. But uh, enough of that. We're excited to welcome Professor Spears, Dr. Spears. He's got a doctorate in, from the University of Tennessee. And the main focus of research is actually tree rings and how climate and different effects affect tree rings. And I think you're going to talk a little bit tonight how that can correlate to muscles. So we're excited to get him up here. Uh, Hillary Howard is a grad student of his. She is going to try to make it. She's been uh, a little blocked up, so she's going to try to get here and hopefully chime in a little bit. And then I'll let him introduce a couple other young ISU, uh, now alumni, but students that have participated in some of this research. So. Really excited to have Dr. Spears. I think a lot of people told me they've been looking forward to this more talk more than any. So we're glad to have you up here, and we're glad to have some additional research by some Indiana State students. So, Professor? Thank you. <laughs> How are you all tonight? It's good to see you. So I'm Jim Spear, as he said. I'm a professor of geography and geology at Indiana State University, and specifically I'm a dendrochronologist. So I look at tree rings to figure out environmental variables. So this is what I'm usually looking at, things like this. And I can, you can look at these. And how many of you have counted tree rings before on a stump? All right. And most people usually have. So we can look very quickly at the age of a tree. There's a lot more that we can do with this. And I'll get into that in the talk and how we can kind of bridge this over to looking at muscle shells in kind of a process that we call sclerochronology. So we're dating bony structures as well as we can date woody structures as long as they put on these annual layers. Let me introduce my co-authors. Uh, so Tim Dival is a graduate student. Um, we started working on these muscles back in 2019 through a, a tree ring research class that also had a sclerochronology component to it. And Tim was one of the students that worked with that project. Emily Tickle was an undergraduate, and she was another student working on that project. So some of the data I'll be talking about today is work that they developed back in 2019. Hillary Howard is a new graduate student at ISU. She was actually an undergraduate with us as well, but she's taking this work further. And over the next two years, we'll be working through this muscle collection that we have that we collected with Brendan Kearns to do this work that I'll be talking about. Um, so this is really kind of the preliminary side. We've actually got a little bit of chemistry to show you at the ends. Um, we have started to understand the muscle shells a little bit, but we have some 200 muscle shells to work through and build a chronology where we can look back through time. So these are some of the shells that we've sampled. And this is actually a gooey duck, a different type of clam off the, in the Pacific. And you can see how distinctive these rings are. So these muscles are putting on annual growth layers and we can do the same techniques that we do with tree rings on these growth layers in the muscles. So looking at tree rings, this is an oak cross section. So with the trees, they shut down for part of the year. So in the winter time, they lose their leaves. They go dormant in the spring. As they leaf out, they put on this early row of pores in ring porous wood in these oaks. So this light band is spring growth for the tree. And then throughout the growing season, it puts on this late wood, this darker, these darker fibers throughout the year until the tree shuts down again. So with that annual cycle, based on our day length and our temperature, it causes the trees to shut down, and we have this distinct pattern of annual growth. So then we can measure these growth rings, and we can look at the climatic factors that affects that growth from year to year. So we can look at climate reconstructions. We can really look at anything that affects tree growth. So I oftentimes do ecology. I look at fire history, I look at insect outbreaks. Anything affecting tree growth can be measured in the trees if it's affecting that growth. We use a couple principles to understand this. One of this is the principle of limiting factors. Whatever is most limiting to the trees or the muscle shells is what gets recorded in those 
organisms. So in this, this is actually a sketch of a ponderosa pine from the western United States where it's a dry environment. So in years, there's a lot of pre precipitation. We get wide rings. Years of little precipitation or rainfall, we get small rings. So with that, we can do this rainfall reconstruction for the lifetime of the trees. The main principle that makes dendrochronology a science is this principle of cross-dating, where we can take samples uh, from different trees and within the same tree, match up the pattern of wide narrow rings, and determine the exact year of every ring of growth in this wood. So we'll go out to the field when we're doing dendrochronology, tree ring research, and we'll sample 20 trees in the stand with two cores per tree. And I can show you that instrument. We use a, a hollow drill to core this into the tree. So most of this work is manual where we're turning this into the tree and it cuts a pencil sized wood out of the tree, leaving the tree healthy and taking very little of the cambium away from the tree, very little of the living material. Then we can get our entire sample on a core from bark to pith, and we can look at that series of rings. So when we're done, you can come up and look at all these tools that we have up here and some different samples. So we'll take two cores per tree of living trees, and with that, we have our anchor in time. So we know when we went out and sampled, and that's the beginning of our chronology or our time series. So then we can work our way back. We can match up within the tree, two cores, between all those trees, so 40 cores. And we can start seeing this pattern of wide narrow rings. Here, 1972 is a small ring, if you can see that, very small in there. And that will be consistent from tree to tree. So then we can determine that pattern. And in some cases, 1972 might be so harsh on that tree that it doesn't put on growth that year. So then we can determine from cross-dating that this tree is missing a ring for that year and insert that, get the pattern back on track, and then we can get that dating for the entire time sequence. And by having replication, 40 different samples that we're looking at, we can determine every time the A tree is missing some rings or missing some data. Then we can go further back in time and we can take samples out of a stump, something that was cut sometime in the past, back in the 1800s, and we can match that pattern up against this, against this series of wide neural rings in our master chronology, and we can tell when that stump was cut. And then we can go further back, take samples out of cabins, or we've sampled around here in the Wabash and Erie Canal, uh, some of the timbers that came out of that on uh, 641, McDaniel coming through, we've got one of those timbers over here. So we can look at the timber, the wood that they were using, and when they were cutting that wood to go into the canal. So then we can start looking at archeology span for what we're looking at back through time. And through this entire process, we're getting older and older samples that also allows us to build this record further back in time. So with cross-dating, now, even though our trees might only be 100 years old, we can build a record that goes back thousands of years. And that's now telling us about long-term climate, where we can understand climate change on a bigger time scale, on a broader perspective. So this is the principle of, of cross-dating that really makes dendrochronology and sclerochronology a science. So as you all have counted rings before, we can do that on a stump and get a pretty good estimate for age. But now we can demonstrate that we can tell exactly the age of every ring and another dendrochronologist can come up and pick up that sample and do the process as well to replicate what we've done to test whether or not we're getting the right answers. So also with cross dating, it's the only way that we can date these dead samples as well. We could count rings and tell the age of this dead sample, but it's only matching that pattern up with a master chronology that we can tell when did that tree get cut um, for our specific information. So all of this, gives us an environmental indicator where we can go back through even longer than the lifetime of the organism. So matching these patterns up through time, we can go back again hundreds to thousands of years for these environmental reconstructions. There's a lot going on in the slide, and these are all different applications that I've used with dendrochronology that I've done specifically. Um, being geeks, we like to come up with words. John will appreciate this. Uh, we tack dendro onto any different field, and that's the, a new word that we're doing. So dendroarchaeology is just looking at archaeology through tree rings. And we can do that by dating wood cabins. Uh, we've actually started dating some of the cabins at Fowler Park um, that Adam Grossman was interested in for figuring out the age of these. We have some idea of their age, but not specifically. So we started looking at those cabins. We can even date musical instruments. So a music professor at the University of Cincinnati has this cello that is supposed to be an Amati instrument. So older than Stradivarius, made in the 1600s. So we can test the hypothesis of whether or not this is an Amati by looking at the rings. We have to date it against a modern chronology of trees from that area where that instrument would have been made, in this case in Italy, 
And the best that we could do is actually disprove the hypothesis. We can provide evidence kind of supporting that this is a Mahdi. If no rings exist after a Mahdi's lifetime, then we can support the hypothesis that this is an Amadi instrument. And so far, that seems to be the case. Um, and when we do this work, we can help support arguments for the value of these instruments. Um, but it's amazing. You can see the rings on here. There are about 120 rings on that surface of the cello. And we can date it against the other side. So if you split it down the middle, not physically, but you can look at the rings on each side and match those up. I was very nervous working on this instrument. This is probably a $2 million instrument, and I'm hovering over it with a, a camera, and it's sitting in my lab on a cushion. And in the end, uh, the, the musician actually played the cello for us in the lab, which I think was my favorite part of it. Um, we can do dendroclimatology as well, and this is actually probably the main application that we use for dendrochronology and for sclerochronology is understanding past climate. Uh, one project I worked on with a master's student was looking at samples out of Pakistan, and that's one of the, the rare cases I've had where we have a 600-year-long record of pine trees, and you can see the hockey stick curve. You can see the tree growing along normally, and it's just accelerating growth for the last probably about 40 years. In that particular case, <clears throat> more moisture, more rainfall is getting into this area in Pakistan, so it's an increase in rainfall that's actually causing this increase in growth. So we can see this effect in the trees and reconstruct that through time. Most of what I do is dendroecology, so looking at ecological effects. Emerald ash borer is a big issue around here. It's amazing if you core into the base of an ash tree that is obviously dying from emerald ash borer, the tree says it's doing fine. You take a sample out of the stem, and the rings are just as large as they've ever been until it dies. Um, it's actually, we've did a, we did a stem analysis on these trees to look at the effect on the growth, and the tree is being girdled by the, the larva of the insect. So it's dying back from the canopy from the top. My hypothesis is because it's a, a bark feeding insect, it's feeding in the cambium, the tree is trying to overgrow the insect to defeat it. So it's putting on very fast growth at the base. And it keeps doing that until it runs out of photosynthetic potential. It's lost so much crown, it just collapses. So we can look at this tree response to things like emerald ash borer. When we know when the insect was introduced, um, we can see that a little bit where emerald ash borer was introduced in, in Michigan accidentally. So we know when it came to the United States. We actually found it at ISU in 2012 in our parking lot. This was the first finding of it in our county. And we could look at the the individual cells in there to look at the, how the tree is conducting water. So we call it hydro, hydrologic conductance based on the cell size. And from that, we can see that the, that larva, the insect actually arrived in 2011 and started the decline of the trees and we didn't find it until 2012. So we could actually see its first occurrence here. We can look at fire scars in trees and reconstruct fire history. This helps us understand a lot about the Western fires, about why we have such large fires today. Most of those landscapes, if we look at their history, Many of them we see had fires every three to seven years. It depends upon the ecosystem. And then we stopped fire for 120 years. So now when we have fires come through, there's so much fuel on the landscape that we have catastrophic fires. My dissertation was on oak mast reconstruction. So I made up a new word for that, which was dendromast ecology. Uh, I think one person has used that word in, in their own publications. But masting is the synchronous fruiting in trees. So we know with oak trees, some years they'll put on a huge number of acorns, other years they put on very few. So this should be a trade-off for the carbon in the tree. Is it putting its effort into reproductive effort, into making acorns, or is it putting into incremental growth? So we expect the tree to trade off between these things and have a small ring the year of masting. It turns out that was only the case in about 25% of the time. Very frequently the tree would do good growth and also have good mast years. And it seems that the trees in that case are storing carbohydrates where it can do both of those things. Uh, to go a little bit more quickly, we can go through dendrohydrology. We can do stream flow reconstructions because the trees are recording the rainfall that also goes into the streams finally. So by doing a regional reconstruction, we can look at stream flow. We can look at flood scar events. Uh, I did a research project in Bhutan during a field week where we were looking at a, um, a cyclone came in and caused these massive floods on the stream, and we can see that impact on the trees and reconstruct when that happened. 
We can look at dendrochemistry as well. So the trees are picking up everything around them. As they take up water, they're taking up the chemistry from the ground as well. So we can use something like an X-ray fluorescence instrument, a portable XRF, and I'll show a picture in a little bit, to look back through time and see what chemistry the tree has been picking up. We did a research project again with a class um, near the Sugar Creeks, uh, which one is that? So it's on First Avenue. Uh, there's um, in kind of an auto place there. Back behind that, um, Pat Martin found a site where they were dumping chemicals, and we actually sampled the um, cottonwood trees that were along the Wabash there. And we could actually see the chemistry coming off of that site and going into the trees, picking up heavy metals and things. And we can look at the timing of that contamination plume. So finally, while we're here today, we can look at sclerochronology. So the trees, of course, most of these trees are putting on this annual growth layer, but some organisms also put on a chemical layer. In our case, mussels in the Wabash will put on one layer of calcium carbonate each year. And it actually, it goes through kind of a light and dark band for every year of growth. So we can look at that growth back through time and we can date them just like we do tree rings and we can build these long chronologies like we do with tree rings. And then one of our main interests is look into this and look at the chemistry of these mussels as well. So finally, we haven't gotten there yet. We hope that once we build these chronologies, we can actually look at the effect of the Clean Water Act on these mussel shells. So prior to that, do we see higher chemistry in the water? And afterwards, do we see the system improving? So these are some of the, the animals that we have been able to date with scler sclerochronology. And I should say some of these slides coming up here are from Brian Black at the University of Arizona, who does most of the sclerochronology work. So we have Pacific rockfish that are over 100 years old, freshwater drum at 70 years, freshwater mussels at over 100 years in age. This is a gooey duck clam in the Pacific, uh, over 150 years in age. And with sclerochronology, we've documented the oldest living animal that we know of in the world. And it's a clam that's over 510 years old. So this is Arctica islandica. It's a, a clam that lives in the Arctic Ocean and puts on this little increment of growth every year. And again, we can date those against each other develop the chronology and also be confident with our dating that this is the true age of this organism. And we found individuals over 500 years in age. We can also do this work with some types of corals. If it's a massive coral that puts down a layer each year, we can also drill through those corals and we can look at the, the history of those corals. Now with tree rings, we can date what's going on on the landscape. With sclerochronology, with corals, and with these clams and fish, we can tell what's going on in the oceans. And the ocean temperature drives a lot more of our climate than what we see on the landscape. The landscape is more responding to that. So if we can reconstruct sea surface temperature from these things, we can get a much better view at things like El Nino Southern Oscillation. So these large teleconnections that are affecting our climate globally, we can pick that up much clearer in these shells one of the reasons for that is this is a chemical process to put on the calcium carbonate in the shell where the trees are running everything through a biological filter to put on their annual rings. So sclerochronology actually seems to be, it has demonstrated to be cleaner, a cleaner signal for climate. So to talk a little bit about how we do some of this work, this is a otolith. This is a fish bone out of the, the uh, uh, ear of the fish. And this cause gives the fish the ability to balance. We also have otoliths in our own ears. They don't grow as much as fish do. But we can take out this otolith, which is a destructive process, and we can look at that. So you can see the size of it's pretty small. We can cut it with a rock saw, section it, and then polish it up. And you can see on that surface the rings on that individual otolith. So even though that's a small bone in the ear of the fish, we can look at all of the years on that and figure out its age. So blowing that up a little bit, we can see that this fish was born in 1933. We can date that age. We can date through this transect and look at that pattern of wide narrow rings throughout that ear bone throughout for that fish's life. We know that it was collected in 1989. So this is the year of capture. Uh, the fish was caught and we, uh, the ear bone was extracted. And we can look into this pattern. I mentioned El Nino and we see this growth in 1983, 1958, this increase in growth there's warmer sea surface temperatures and the fish is growing very quickly because of that. So we can pick that up in the signal that we get from these fish otoliths. We measure those ring widths and then we can do statistics with that. We can take it to any calibration data set, compare it to climatic data and look at that history of 
uh, sea surface temperature for comparison to these fish otoliths. This is a gooey duck. Um, this is actually the main clam that goes into clam chowder. So my friend Brian Black says that if you're eating clam chowder, you're probably eating clams that are older than your grandmother. So these organisms are oftentimes over 100 years old when we look at them. And this is the main fishery off the Pacific coast, and this is most of the clam that we eat. So we can take the shell, section it from the beak on through, and take our sample out of that, and then look at the surface. And this is the gooey duck rings. This is what I was showing at the beginning. And it looks just like tree rings. It's very distinctive. I have to say I'm a little biased towards tree rings, even still today. Looking at tree rings under the microscope, it's a beautiful view. When you look into that, you see the individual cells that make up that ring. And you can look at the cell wall thickness, the size of the lumen. You're looking at a lot of biology that tells you what's going on in the tree on a fine scale. With sclerochronology, it's actually just a color difference. There's a little bit more protein in the darker band and a little bit less in the lighter band. So when you zoom into this, there's actually no definition that you're looking at. It's actually just a growth of calcium carbonate. So you're only looking at the color differences between a light and dark band. So you don't get quite the definition that you do with tree rings, which I think as we move forward with this, we'll see that with tree rings, we can get a little bit finer resolution with the work that we do. We can look at those individual cells like I was talking about with emerald ash borer, and with that pull out other variables more so than what we can do with this. But also think about what the, the shell is doing, the organism is doing. This is, again, recording sea surface temperature very tightly through a chemical reaction. But the organism is also picking up the chemistry around it and putting it into that shell as well. So this is a great reservoir or record for us for the, the chemistry that the organism has experienced. So I want to show you a couple examples. There's some different techniques that we use. Sometimes we use thin sections. Sometimes this is an acetate peel that we actually put on the surface and peel off, and it actually keeps the rings on it. Then we can scan that or look at it under a microscope. And then we can measure those rings that we do on a, we'll do this work on a computer. And this is the chronology that we're building up from 1945 to 2004. And then again, compare this to climatic data to look at what's affecting its growth. When we look into this in more detail, we can look at these specific small rings. So this is the limiting factor that I was talking about. What is slowing down the growth of that organism? And that usually entrains a pattern that we can match from one organism to another. So 1956, 65 was small, 1994 was small, 81 was large, often uh, could be an El Nino response, 1998 was large, which was a strong El Nino year as well. So then we can start looking at the climatic factors that affect this growth. Then we, we build these, these curves, do wiggle matching. We match up these curves, and in this case, we have a modern chronology, a live collection that we can get. And part of Brian Black's work is he's looking at these death assemblages of shells that are on the bottom of the ocean, just these piles of shells that have built up over time. And that's the red line in here where he's been able to build this back. So the modern chronology goes back into the early 1900s. But from dead shells that we cross-state against that, we can take this back to the 19, or sorry, 1840s or even further in time with enough time spent in this analysis to build up that chronology step by step back through time. Uh, just to show a couple different organisms, this is a yellowfin sole from the Bering Sea, freshwater drum from Wisconsin. Again, very distinctive rings that we can pick up and measure. And then freshwater mussels, uh, this is, again, some of Brian's examples. And you can see those individual layers on the edge of the mussel shell. And we can date those layers. This is Pacific Ocean Perch from the Bering Sea. Now, with all of this, we can start piecing together a bigger picture as well. So we don't study each one of these things in isolation, but we're interested in that entire system, studying the ecosystem. Um, I'm a biogeographer is one of the definitions of what I do. So I, I'm interested in biological organisms and how they behave on the landscape and what they record of that landscape as well. So with biogeography, we synthesize all of these things. I need to understand the climate and how that works. I need to understand the individual organisms and how they grow and they form these rings. I need to understand the geology as well for these systems and what are they picking up from the soils as well as contamination and then put all of this together through environmental science to understand what we're doing in this environment today with humans in that system. So looking at that bigger view, we can look at our trees out of the forest and build up tree ring chronologies. Then mussel shells out of freshwater streams, build up that chronology. 
Then off into the ocean, we can look at gooey ducks near shore. And then we can go out deeper onto the continental shelf of the rockfish and look at those organisms. So now we can look at this entire transect of temperature changes and responses across the entire landscape. So that leads us here to the Wabash River. Does anybody know this character? <laughs> Brendan Kearns uh, has brought me into this work, actually. So Brendan was interested in collecting some mussels. Um, he was working with uh, the sisters at uh, St. Mary's of the Woods to rejuvenate their uh, shell chapel that's there, um, and was interested in the science of this as well, understanding what we can see in the river and understanding this history of mussels in the river. So together we were able to get a, a research permit to collect dead mussel shells. I should point out that um, it's illegal to collect mussel shells. You can't go out and collect mussels today, partly because the population is so low that it's, it's not a healthy population. We're trying to get that back. Um, and you can't even collect dead mussel shells without a permit um, because they don't know if you collected live mussel shells and kept, kept the dead ones afterwards. So you get in trouble if you're just collecting any mussel shells. So just be warned <laughs> if you're... If you like these shells, don't run out and collect them. Brendan knew where these, <clears throat> where a shell deposit was on a point bar, so this kind of accumulation of shells that are just washing downstream and washing up on the shore. So he took me out there. This is our collection permit. Uh, somebody was asking where it's from, and I wanted to check that. What is this? Division of Fish and Wildlife. So IDEM and DNR uh, do these. So Department of Natural Resources give these permits to be able to do this, and um, we needed to be doing science to be able to have this permit. And also from the benefit from that, we could work with the, the shell um, shrine as well. So this is what Brendan knew about. So coming out to this site, this we passed many different point bars and banks, and most of them are sand covered. We come out to this particular one, and every almost everything you see on here is a, a mussel shell. There's a few rocks in here, very few, but all of these are mussel shells. It's very unusual, and it's probably because there's a rocky, uh, component just upstream from this underwater where the, the mussels can get a hold and stay there. But then as storms come along, they get broken off and washed downstream, and this is where they happen to accumulate. So we spent maybe half an hour out here and each collected a bucket of about 200 mussel shells. And that's going to keep Hillary <laughs> busy for probably in the next two years. Um, it's a lot of work to get through all of these, these shells and do this process. So this is uh, the bucket that I brought back and the shells coming off of there. Um, it's an interesting process. We're somewhat limited in what we can do with these shells. So we can look at their age. Um, just off of the collection that we have, we actually can't cross-date them because we don't have this anchor in time. We don't know when the mussels died. Luckily, we've got another researcher at Indiana State University, Dr. Jen Latimer, who has a collection permit as well for mussels, and they're interested in the chemistry in the water and also the chemistry in all the organisms. So Dr. Latimer and her student, Catherine Mudica, a PhD student, are collecting mussels, they're collecting otters um, they get from the DNR, they collect fish from what people have captured, and they're looking at the chemistry inside of them. What, what are they picking up? They focused on lead so far, and they can see the bioaccumulation of lead, where they can see lead in the organisms, but they, it goes into the fish, and then it also goes in the otters, and it's the highest level in the otters because they're eating all these organisms that accumulate those chemicals. And lead isn't going anywhere. It just accumulates up uh, through, through all of that feeding. So my hope is with their samples, they can get modern samples that are recently killed. And with that, we can get an anchor in time and build a modern chronology that we can date these dead shells against. What we're looking at right now is trying to figure out just how old are these mussel shells in the Wabash River, how long do they live, and then also something about their chemistry. But it's only when we get that master dating chronology through time that we can put that chemistry into a temporal perspective. What was the chemistry back through time in the river? So these are some of the samples that we worked with. As I showed before, we're cutting from the beak on down through there and uh, creating a thin section out of the center of that shell that we polish up and look at. So some of the shells that we're dealing with and how we cut through that. These are the students from the Denver Chronology class in 2019 at ISU in our rock cutting workshop. And this is Emily, one of the co-authors, cutting down one of these shells. So this is a, a rock cutting blade. It's uh, cooled off for the water stream that comes through here, cutting a fine section off of that. We'll epoxy that to a, a glass slide that we can look through. And then we cut the rest of that section off very carefully. <clears throat> 
And then we spend a lot of time polishing it. We actually, because we can't get too close to the blade with our fingers, we actually take off a lot of that volume just with abrasives, so just with sanding um, on that surface. And then we also, through that process, we also polish that surface that we can then look at and see the fine resolution of the rings. Um, this is a, yeah, I guess I'll tell the story. So when I went off to college, I didn't know what I wanted to do specifically. I just knew that I wanted to do science and I loved all science. So I picked the hardest thing I could think of, which was astrophysics. I always tell my students, don't use this as a decision process. Find the hardest thing you can and go for that. Um, I actually did astrophysics for three years as an undergrad and got to do some research in labs. But I got extremely bored because we'd go to these amazing mountaintops and then you'd sit in a computer room and never look outside and just stare at a computer screen the entire time. Because if you're doing high level astrophysics, you're dealing with uh, individual pixels on a charge couple device to count the electrons that are coming in from a star. You're not looking through a telescope in the, the beauty of that landscape. So then my first senior year, I changed majors to geology, looking at geoscience. And the basis of the story is I wanted to study all science and I never got over that. Still today, I want to be able to study all science. And really dendrochronology allows me to do this and sclerochronology now where I can study insects and I can study the geology and I can study climate. I get to do all this work. So with Brendan bringing me into this project, it's like, okay, we're studying muscles now. So I got to read this book, 190 page book on identifying muscles and start trying to figure out what these muscles are. So it's always kind of back to the, the beginning, back to the basis of trying to understand this system and even down to the small part of understanding these muscles. Historically, there were about 90 different muscle species in Indiana. Today, um, we're probably more at about 30 to 35 species that we can still find here today. So we've lost quite a few of them. Um, but it's a great, great resource and a great history of the, the muscles and the variety that's here. So these are some of the thin section pieces. So you can see how chunky these are. This is what we cut with a rock saw. The rest of that thickness we have to polish down um, just with polishers to take down the thickness so that we can shine light through and then look at the rings on these individual muscles. So we spend a lot of time <clears throat> sanding these down and then finally get down to these fine thin sections so we can shine light through. And this is what we can see at the end. So shining light through that, you can see these individual layers and they actually get really tiny out here on the outside. So simply by counting these rings, as you've done on a stump, now we can start telling the age of these muscles. How old do they get? So looking at some of these shells, these are a number of the shells that we've been able to identify. So a maple leaf here on the left, a three-horn, a three horn, a warty back, a three-edge, a giant floater, a spectacle case. So all of these amazing organisms that we can find. And again, quite a variety just on this collection on this one shore. And these are just a few of the ones that we identified. <clears throat> so what we found, these are three of the thin, thin sections that Tim and Emily worked up during that dendrochronology class. It took an entire semester figuring out our process, identifying these organisms, getting this polish where we can look at the individual rings. And we find that the youngest that we sampled was actually 28 years old. And the oldest was 59 years old. So these muscles, these small little pieces that we have in the Wabash River, these are old organisms that we're dealing with. So as uh, environmental scientists, this is interesting. We can, we can look at the long history that we can pull out of the Wabash from these muscle shells. So finally, my uh, talk teased a little bit about the chemistry that we can see from these. So I was able to get a little bit of chemistry done on these samples um, just as a first look. So each one of these is a different sample that we've looked at. They're not really organized in any particular order, except for here on the end are four samples that I collected from Maine near where my brother lives. So these are ocean samples compared to our Wabash River samples. Um, and our basic, under, basic thought about this is what's the chemistry in these organisms versus a control versus some other set that's coming out of the ocean. One thing that's good to see is compared to the ocean samples, we actually have relatively low lead that the mussels are picking up. We know that we have lead contamination issues in Vigo County. Uh, Jen Latimer has done quite a bit of research with this. And we know lead is one of our major concerns and one of our kind of major heritage effects, long-term effects that we have, mostly from the, the lead paint that we used in the 1800s and through the 19, early 1900s. 
And by washing that off of our walls, it's now in our soil. So we have quite a bit of lead. But compared to the ocean samples, uh, the mussels in the Wabash River have a relatively low level of lead. This is five to six parts per million, which is actually extremely low compared to what we're getting in soils. We've sampled some soils that are over 20,000 parts per million of lead. And I sampled one windowsill in some, a friend's house that was 80,000 parts per million of lead. So lead is definitely an extreme issue. This is probably saying that the mussels are not picking that much up from the environment. And that's another thing that we need to think about as we look at the chemistry of these, <clears throat> is that they're not going to necessarily be a, a true and full indicator of the environment around them. They filter themselves what they pick up out of the environment, what's useful to them, and what can they use in their, their shell or in the tree. So in this case, it seems like they're not picking up much lead because they're at such low levels. Um, but interestingly, the, the marine samples are actually higher. Strontium is another thing that we can look at. Same organization, strontium on the outside, and this is actually not too surprising. Strontium is a major component in ocean and seawater, in marine water. Um, we actually use it for radiometric dating of marine sediments because it's, it's so prevalent and it's, um, it's common in ocean water. We're not seeing so much of that in our samples, although on the same scale, we're at about three, 250 to 300 parts per million of strontium in our Wabash samples, so higher than the lead, uh, but the marine samples are extremely high. So this is hopeful for me because this is something that we expect. We can see high levels of strontium where we expect it and lower levels in the river. Then we can look at something like manganese, which is not as good of a story for us. In the marine sediments, manganese is relatively low. Some of these samples that we're getting out of the Wabash are many times higher. So a lot of the two of these samples, half of our samples from the ocean, were actually at zero. And we're up to 900 parts per million of manganese in some of these mussel shells. So this is just the first look at that. And this is telling us something that, that manganese might be an interesting indicator to look at the chemistry in the Wabash River through time. Um, I need to do a little bit more work and see where that manganese is coming from. Uh, definitely in the mussel shells, they're picking up a lot of chemistry. Most of it's calcium. They're picking up iron. There's some potassium in there as well. Some, most of those things are, are normal. So we're looking at what's coming out of the environment that shouldn't be in those mussel shells and trying to figure that out. So in conclusion, we do see that mussels in the Wabash River can reach at least 59 years in age. Again, this is just a small sample set that we've looked at out of our 200 samples. And the work that Hillary has in front of her is to look at the rest of those samples. And we can actually start building what we call a floating chronology. We can date these mussel shells against each other, even if we don't have an anchor in time, and we can start piecing that back through time. So we can say that this mussel shell was growing 100 years prior to this one, even if we can't put exact years on that until we get the modern chronology, which we're working towards. We see that we can see chemistry out of these, and we're seeing the chemistry that we expect. That strontium signal in the marine sediments is what we expect. So it's nice to confirm that and see this, this information coming through. So in the future, what we'd like to do is build this exactly dated chronology through time, through our anchor in time to the modern day, and then look into the chemistry in the individual shells. Um, I actually didn't put the pictures in here of the XRF. It's a X-ray fluorescence instrument. It takes about a five millimeter aperture and it's measuring all the chemistry that it can see through that area. So on the muscle shells, you're measuring much of that individual shell many years for that. The best technique that we can use, we can use micro milling, even with a small Dremel drill bit and drill out individual layers of that shell, individual years, and we can put them through an inductively coupled, coupled optical emission spectroscope that Dr. Latimer has and look at a higher resolution of the chemistry coming out of those shells. So with more work, we can look at this year by year variability in chemistry in the shells. And that's what's really going to be telling as we take that back through time and across 1972 with the Clean Water Act, do we see this change in chemistry through time? So that's where we're going with this. So with that, I would like to acknowledge Brendan Kearns for getting me into this project and uh, helping with the field work to be able to get out to that site. The Denver Chronology class in fall of 2019 that helped with the sample preparation and all of this work. Uh, IDEM and the DNR for our sampling permits and Dr. Latimer for some of the techniques that we've used, some of the, the work in her lab. And thank you for your time. Definitely, I hope there are some.
Yeah. Does the strontium uh, relate just to, to atomic bomb tests? No, it's naturally occurring in the ocean. Um, we so we can look at strontium. What is it? Strontium thorium dating. We actually use in marine sediments that goes back millions and millions of years. Um, we have a difficult time since the bomb testing because it throws all that chemistry off in the modern day. But with old samples, we can actually use it for dating. So it's naturally occurring. But yeah, there's a lot of the. <laughs> A lot of the chemistry that comes out of the bomb testing, we can actually use uh, carbon-14 bomb spike testing in tropical trees to date them. I uh, actually just came back from Zambia like two weeks ago. I was teaching a dendrochronology field school in Zambia. Luckily, they form annual rings, so we could work with that. But in the Congo, just a little bit to the north, where it's more tropical environment, the trees are putting on just continuous growth. They don't shut down for part of the year because there's no change in day length or in temperature. Um, but what we can see is a 1962 spike in carbon-14 from atmospheric bomb testing. Mm -hmm. So by sampling many samples across the cross-section, we can see where that spike is, and then we can figure out how much growth goes on that tree each year by understanding where that spike is. So, yeah, the bomb testing has changed our environment a lot. Sometimes we can use that as an indicator. In the back. Are you going to, uh, since Brudex just kind of finished up this year, are you going to go back to your study 17 years ago and see how much those cicadas increased growth rings? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Um, you know, I didn't really, so I spent more time being a tourist around cicadas this year than actually studying them. So back in 2004, we had an NSF grant um, with Keith Clay at Indiana University to study the emergence of the insect of uh, cicadas. Uh, Keith was looking at how they're affecting different trees, what they over, overposit into, what they avoid, how they behave. I was looking at their effect on tree growth, and we can do something called a superposed epoch analysis. It's a very fancy name, but you basically just take the emergence year of every insect, uh, so every 17 years for that insect, overlap them together, and we can see the prior growth and the post growth from those emergence events, and statistically look at how they're affecting the tree. And with that, I hypothesized that the uh, cicadas would be damaging the tree in the nymphal stage because that's when they're doing most of their growth, that's most of, the, most of their lifetime, and that they'd be released when they came out. And that wasn't the case at all. We didn't see any effect from the nymphs in the tree. There was a little bit of decrease in growth when cicadas came out and they flagged the trees, they oviposit in the trees and affect the branches. But the main effect was actually a benefit to the growth five years after the emergence. And you saw this kind of flourish of growth, this increase in growth in almost every tree species that we sampled on every site five years after. And I'm not enough of a biochemist to understand why that is. It's probably some nutrient cycling of the decay of the cicadas that helps the nutrients for the trees five years in the future. But to me, it speaks to these ecological systems where we see cicadas maybe as an annoyance or a problem. Uh, we can't talk over the drone of the insects, but it's connected in this ecological system where we might think of it as a problem for the trees, but it turns out to be the main effect is a benefit. So every insect system that I've studied, I found that that's true, that you have this balance, if you will, but this benefit. Um, I talk with my students all the time about not talking about insect outbreaks as a pest or a problem. Uh, it's a natural response or a natural process in the forest. I didn't get into the global forest decline. That's another area that we're researching. Um, I've got a major research uh, project that I've been doing for five years in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem because that forest is declining. It's really disappearing and as you look across the landscape you just see dead forest after dead forest. And what we found in that system is that increased temperature seems to stress the trees and the trees are actually switching their climatic response uh, in about the 1950s. And since then insect systems are growing and the insects are coming in and killing off the trees. Now, this isn't the insect's fault. It's a response to the system, and the insects are actually uh, accelerating this change on the landscape that is happening because of this temperature change. So it's removing the existing trees that are on the landscape, and some other system will come in in its place. So we see this kind of ecological response in that system. That was a long response to your question. But no, I haven't gotten back to study the cicadas. Um, the nice thing with dendrochronology is we can sample that at any time and we have the entire history of the trees. So I could look, when we did that study, we could look back over 100 years and look at that response and get some statistical strength with it. Um, so then I went on to the next project. <laughs> but we were tourists for them. I read where the Forestry Service is starting to move trees up. And yeah. Is there any such thing going on in this area? 
Um, that's a good question, not that I'm aware of. So um, in response to climate change, so another area that I'm really interested in is paleoecology. We can look back over the long-term vegetation change across North America. With the last glacial maximum, we had ice coming down to Turkey Run, basically, and four miles of ice over Chicago. As those glaciers retreat, we can see forests move further north in that process, and we can measure the rate of that northward movement uh, through pollen analysis by looking at pollen and lake sediments and how the trees move across the landscape. When we look at that, their response to that glacial retreat was not as fast as the climate change that we have today. So foresters are concerned that the climate change is happening so quickly that tree migration won't be able to keep up with that change. So they're taking trees from southern sites and planting them further north. One thing that we're finding with this, if you're reading uh, the popular literature on these connected systems is, um, I don't know if you're looking into your microbiome and that work today, we find that if we take trees that are bare root and we plant them to the north, they die and they don't survive. But if we take trees in a root ball that has all of the mycorrhizal fungi and the bacteria and the mites and springtails that are in that soil and you plant that further north, those trees do fine. So it's actually an entire system that we have to move to keep up with this climate change. In, and I don't know if you're a gardener. I know John's a gardener in the back. If you look at cold hardiness zones about when you can plant different plants, that's shifted for half of the United States. Half of Indiana has shifted to a different climate zone since the 1990s, I think is the last time they did that map. So this, it's naturally happening where the plants that we grow here today used to do very well in Kentucky. And we're going to keep seeing that change. Um, so I don't know of any specific work in Indiana where they're planting more southern trees. But um, if you look into just the nurseries for what they have available today versus what they had 50 years ago, I bet you'll see that change happening because it's what succeeds, what survives here. But, yeah. I was just reading that the armadillos are moving, <laughs> yeah. north, moving north, and I've, I've been uh, swearing at the uh, bush honeysuckle, mm -hmm. for the, and, and I kept thinking, I had honeysuckle when I moved to this area in the 60s, mm. and it just behaved nicely. Yeah. It was, you know, it didn't, it didn't choke everything out, yeah. and now, you know, you can just whack and whack and you drive yeah. down a a, a country street and it's just solid. Yeah. And and so you know what you're talking about really explains that. Yeah. Yeah, we see that change quite a bit. Armadillos have now been found in Indiana. Uh, I think we had our first sighting maybe a couple of years ago, um, which is just shocking <laughs> that they're there. Um, I don't know um, bush honeysuckle's response to climate specifically. Some of that could just be growth over time and kind of released by birds because they like the seeds so much. Peter could probably answer this better, but we see quite wide dispersal of honeysuckle and then it just survives very well. It's also allelopathic, so it puts out chemistry that damages other things around it where it can survive better. So it's out competing other things that are in that area. Um, and then it just takes a hold and it, it's, it's there to stay because the chemistry is now changed in that soil. So yeah, it's a, a difficult process. I've worked with Jane Morse quite a bit on trying to remove bush honeysuckle from Dobbs Park and different places. And I wonder how much of that's a losing battle. Like, are we able, I mean, you could beat it back in an area, but I don't know if you're ever going to remove it completely and defeat it in, in Indiana. Do they keep that up at uh, the Morton Arboretum deliberately that way? Then, I don't know. With well, honeysuckle? In, in, in the Morton Arboretum, yeah. you've got a road you can drive on. And this is, this half is what it looked like when the pioneers came. Mm. And the other side is what it is. Yeah. You could walk through the woods as it was when the pioneers came here, but that you're not going to walk. Yeah, it's just so dense. So they have to deliberately just keep working at that. Yeah, yeah, it'd be a lot of work. I'm I grew up in Arizona, so I'm used to this in the Western United States, where fire use of fire has changed so much. Where you walk through today, we did sampling and had a cross section strapped to my back, and I couldn't get through the woods. The trees were so tight together, and I was so wide at that point. Um, but the normal forest, you could drive an old buggy through because it's a park-like setting when you would have fire every three to seven years. So very similar to here, you have that kind of overgrowth and the takeover of that forest, and it completely changes the understory, the spring ephemerals that can come out. It changes that whole system. Yeah.
Yeah. So are we looking forward to the cuts coming? <laughs> yeah, I hope not. Uh, you mentioned that I was at University of Tennessee for my PhD. We had kudzu there on my front porch and I would leave for school in the morning and come back in the afternoon and it would literally have grown a foot and a half further across my porch. Kudzu and kudzu will grow up viney into the trees and actually block out the light for the trees and kill trees off. It's so active. The good thing about kudzu though is goats are the answer. Uh, goats love feeding on kudzu. And they've actually started some of that in the southeast to control it by having goat herds come through and feed on kudzu. Um, but yeah, it's with warming temperatures, it's it's on the move. Do do mussels get generally? I mean, bigger. When I say bigger, I mean they're flat or they're flattened. Yeah. I mean, how do they grow? I'm not clear on that. And how big do they get? Yeah. Um, well, they can get quite I mean, large. I, I've, uh, I guess I muscles. can't deny this now, but I picked up a lot of the <laughs> right. out of the Eel River, and I didn't know that it was uh, prohibited in any way. Right. And they don't talk about it that much. It's I not can't imagine that's... getting arrested for that. Although... <laughs> There's so many things. So you can see that growth, kind of these stair steps. And uh, as we look into it, probably even these finer layers are actually some of the annual bands on here. But you can see that growth through time. So so when, when it you, starts off young and you small, cut it this way. Yep, and you cut from the beak on down but through the, here. But the rings are then through the thin layer. Right. Of the if shell. you hold that, I can grab a thin section here. So I didn't. So this is yeah. one of the shells that we've cut, yeah. and then this is not from that shell, but it would be this section here that we've cut off and polished. So it's kind of that section through there. And then if you hold that, get my phone out. Then with transmitted light on this. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I don't know if you can see it in the back, but yeah. you can actually see the rings. So that there. tells you this is about eight or 10 years old? Or well, this one, I don't know if this is our younger, it's at least 29 years old. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so on the outside, there's very thin oh. layers back on this outside component. Yeah, so when you work through that dating, right, we have to do all this under the microscope and it takes quite a bit of time. And then this is uh, one of the ones that I got from the ocean in Maine um, and just larger size. This isn't showing it as well as like this one. If you look at this side in here, you can see all those tiny oh. rings. Uh -huh. This one's probably close to 100 years old. This? <laughs> yeah. And this is just what I picked up on the beach walking with my kids. Is that a muscle or a clam? This is a clam. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's why I always call them. <laughs> yep, yep. 59 years old doesn't seem that old to me. <laughs> I know. It's all relative. The size of it this way is not much of an indicator of age. Um, so it varies by species and the environment. But yeah, they as they grow larger, they're going to be older. So the larger size is going to be an older organism. You can look at these or pass them around. Yeah. Pass these around, you guys can take a look. Yeah. Now there's still live mussels in the river, right? There are, yeah. Yeah, and we see evidence of that from the otters coming through and taking them up and we can see the otter middens just on the sides where, with fresh mussel collections or tr really trash middens from the, the otters. Huh. And that's my hope is that we can use those to get this year's growth of mussels and then build that master chronology where we can date these with exact years on them. You can teach that otter to eat all those, uh, well, they call them Asian. The Asian carp, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if they do. I, I, I've been seeing otter in the last five or six years. Yeah. Asian carp are large, though. I think they could yeah. give an otter a run for its money. I don't know. <laughs> Does the, do the otters pose an additional danger to the mussels? They, they're definitely feeding on the mussels. No. Um, but it's, yeah. that's part of the natural process. Yeah. Um, uh, Charlie was asking about the effect of carp on the mussels, and I'm more concerned about that, where... We've changed the system and introduced a new species, and I think that would have a, a more detrimental effect. What, what's the actual difference between a muscle and a clam? <laughs> um, you know, I don't really know. It's partly, <laughs> partly shape and the organism that we're identifying. I wouldn't be able to tell you biologically why they are in different areas or even where they break on a phylogenetic tree for kind of what differentiates one from the other. So, so clam shells are... Yep. Are, you can't pick up still. Um, 
same as muscle. <laughs> that's what that's what I'm saying. Right. You know, I go out there and I think of something, I think this is a clamshell, and they say, Oh God, no, that you it's illegal. You can't pick that up. Yeah. So I've I'm really a geek with these things, so now that I got into muscles, I'm in my stream in the backyard identifying things, and iNaturalist is a great tool. It will tell you sometimes with accuracy about what things are. Uh, iNaturalist, it's a free app for your phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, so iNaturalist, and you just take a picture, and it uses AI to identify that picture and identify what it is, and then biologists can come in and give you a better identification. But so to your question, I found a lot of uh, Asian clams in our stream. So this is another introduced organism, and you could collect those all that you want, <laughs> and you won't get in trouble for them, but differentiating between what is a mussel versus what's a clam could be an issue. I've never heard of anybody getting in trouble for doing mussel collections, but you can imagine what the intent is. They don't want like large industry going out, and there's beautiful mother of pearl on the inside of these. They would make buttons and make nice uh, jewelry out of them, um, so they don't want large fishing for those types of things. So, is my on my phone? <laughs> Thanks. I'd get home and my phone would be dead. Yeah, it was from doing my transmission of light. Yeah. When you talk about dating trees in particular, and you're going back hundreds of years, are you always dating from live trees? No, you're. Do you use like prehistoric stone trees? We start from live and go back. Um, and that's why we can use the increment bore so that we don't have to kill living trees and we can start that chronology. Um, we can actually do this on petrified wood, and I almost brought some today, but it's, it's heavy to lug around. Um, but petrified wood, hundreds of millions of years old, some of those are well preserved where you can look into them and you can see the same cellular structure that we do in modern trees and you can look at tree rings in that as well. The difficulty to do dendrochronology with that is you would need a depth assemblage of a forest so there are some instances where a volcanic eruption buried a forest, and then you can sample multiple trees in the forest, date them against each other, and build a chronology. And with that, we could answer questions like, is El Nino that we experience today, was that a thing 200 million years ago? And it probably wasn't because of how our oceans have changed orientation over time. But we can look at, the, is there a three to seven year cycle back then as there is today in, in the growth of these trees? So yeah, we can use petrified wood as well. We can't get exact dates on that because we don't have the bridge to get to modern time, but we can look at it relative in time, back, back in time. And then we'd use radiometric dating to put it in millions of years time scale of when that sediment came from. Peter, you had a question earlier. Yeah, uh, I was thinking, you know, your sample of two or 400 uh, mussel shells of different species, you'll be able to age those, I mean, for the, the lifespan that each of those muscles lived before they died. Yeah. So you've got a potential for having sort of a, a life history characterization of each species mm. of how typically you lived 20 versus 30 or 50 oh, years. Right. You be able to pull that off? Yeah, and if it's changed through time. So with uh, the shell fishing that we have done historically, um, I was talking, I think, to John about we have done this actually in archaeological sites where we have a shell midden, we were talking about that, where you have a shell midden that's layered through time. Mm -hmm. And we can see that the oldest shells that they're digging up are really old. And then they get younger and younger through time, which shows that they're actually overfishing that population and taking the younger and younger individuals. So we can look at kind of that, the human response through those ages. We could look at fishing on the Wabash as we date these. Do we only have younger ones in the modern, modern being like up through the 1950s? And do we have older ones that were back in the 1800s if they're preserved? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we could look at that age structure in those populations by species. Yeah. Um, that was actually done with dinosaur bones. So dinosaurs actually put on increments on their bone. And it was uh, Allosaurus. They had a death assemblage of those. I think it was some 20 individuals. And they could look at, they could do an uh, age structure diagram for Allosaurus because of all these organisms and the, the rings on their bones. Um, so that was some amazing work that's also sclerochronology, looking at bony structures. Yeah, so it would be nice to get into the ecology of the, the muscles back through time. Yeah. Yes? What is the linguistic source of your dendro? Yeah, it's Latin. Dendro meaning tree, and chronology is the study of time. So I always ask my students this at the beginning of the semester about who knows what dendrochronology is. And if they do, it's usually because they've studied some Latin. <laughs> and they can piece it together. And then sclero means bone. 
And so chronology is the study of time through bones, and dendrochronology is the study of time through trees. Um, so if you think about a, a dendron as a, a branching, like a, a neural uh, dendron, it's a branching feature. So it has the same base as trees do. It's a good question. Guys, thank you for coming out. Please tour before you leave. Thank you all. <laughs> Professor, thank you very much. Hi, thank you.